Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Storage Investor Show. My guest today is Amber Crucian. She is the Assistant Vice President at Live Oak Bank. Amber, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Give us a little bit, maybe 60 seconds on your background and what you do at Live Oak. Yeah, of course. So I've been with Live Oak for just about five years. I've been with the self-storage team for going on three now. I started out in our servicing department, which most of our folks do. So getting to know how we service our customers on a day-to-day basis. And before that, I worked for uh, several other financial institutions, but more so in the securities and brokerage side of the industry. That's where I started out. Perfect. So we're going to talk mainly about SBA financing, but you did mention before we started the show that you guys do handle other conventional loans as well. So we'll talk about that aspect of things too, but let's focus for now just on the SBA What is it for people who don't know, like what type of loan is it? And generally at a high level, how does it work? And then we'll get into some detailed questions from there. Sure, of course. SBA loans are, in in my opinion, SBA loans are a really great way for folks that are not experienced in an industry to start in the industry to get started, especially if they're looking to reserve their cash and maybe not put as much equity into a project as you would be expected to by most lending partners for a conventional loan. But SBA loans can also be used, you know, for expansion projects, uh, for folks that already have facilities and ownership experience on, under their belt. So it's really the best option whenever it comes to high leverage. Um, it's also considerably less risk for a bank than a conventional loan, primarily because the SBA covers 75% of those loan types. So it's much less risk to the bank whenever it comes from a, to a loan loss perspective. So typically banks can, we can go up to 85 to 90% financing, asking way less in an equity injection from the customer um, than we would have to with a conventional loan. So it's a really great option for high leverage. And we have some, we have some movement as well, as far as how much we can lend in each of those programs. Interesting. Okay. So how does that work exactly? So if you, it, it's through the SBA, but when you say it's good for a local lender and all that. What do you mean by that exactly? I know it helps you get to higher leverage, but do they provide a loan amount up to a certain point and then the SBA kicks in and then the buyer or the client or customer kicks in their equity? Like, how does that actually look? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. I feel like one that we have come up really often because I think, I think that there are a lot of beliefs held about SBA loans just because there's not a ton of education out there. So really with an SBA 7A loan, you're really only working with a lender if they're a preferred lender with the SBA. So if you're going to get a 7A loan, I think it's very smart to keep front of mind to work with a preferred lender, which basically just means that lender has been given a stamp by the SBA to say that they can make final credit decisions in-house, that they don't have to run every single project by the SBA to get approval prior to close. So it does cut off some time in the closing time frame, but it also means that bank most likely has a lot more reps with that loan type and that program. So they understand it a little bit better because there are it's a government backed loans. So there are a lot more nuances to that program than there are going to be with a conventional loan where credit decisions are based on a credit box of that bank specifically. So with the SBA 7A loan, you're pretty much, you're working with nothing but the lender for the most part throughout that entire process. Your loan closes and the lender holds that loan on their books. So you're getting you're getting your servicing from that lender, from their servicing department. So everything pretty much stays with the lender. With an SBA 504, it's a little bit of a different process and the structure of those loans are very different. So with an SBA 504, the structure is 50% first mortgage through the bank that you're working with, through the lender you're working with. 35% is uh, an SBA kind of second mortgage and usually around 15% is what the customer comes in with. It can go as high as 90% leverage if it's an expansion project, but typically we're seeing more around 85%, so that 35% SBA debenture. So that is the the outline of the structure of those loans. So in that case, that 50% first mortgage is always in in place. And then the 35% second mortgage starts out as an interim loan with the bank, especially if there is construction involved, 
the bank kind of takes full risk of that project until CO is received on the construction. And then the SBDA comes in with their portion and takes out that interim loan, usually a couple months after CO. So it's a little bit more involved. Those loans, you, it's a multi-tiered approval process. The preferred lender status doesn't really come into play. So you're working with both the lender, um, what's called a CDC, which is a certified development corporation, and then the SBA as well. So there are multiple hands in the pot, so to speak, with a 504 as opposed to with a 7A. It's much more intrabank depending on the lender that you're working with. No, so there's two buckets almost. It's yes. it's 504, 7A, 7A yep. being a little bit more streamlined, so maybe 504, yes. a few other hoops to jump through. But I guess in my mind, I think of what makes sense. Like, how do you know as a borrower what bucket you fit in with your deal? What and what do the terms look like for each? How do you help somebody make sense of that? If you want to identify, analyze, and invest in the best self-storage deals out there, then you need quality data. TrackedIQ provides accurate, transparent, and vital information for over 57,000 self-storage facilities and 4,000 storage development sites. What sets TrackedIQ apart is their comprehensive data on 70,000 residential and 200,000 commercial construction projects across the U.S., along with traffic counts, flood zone maps, and much more. See why the most sophisticated investors in the industry use Tracked IQ for their underwriting. Visit trackediq.com forward slash Chris, K-R-I-S, to book a demo today and save 10% on your subscription. The link is in the description below. Tracked IQ, analyze more deals with more confidence. Yeah, so I think that's honestly where it's really important to have a lender that knows both of those product types really well and understands the programs because, like I said, there are a lot of nuances to these programs um, that a lender really needs to be knowledgeable of in order to educate the customer if they don't know about those programs because they are government-backed. So those guarantees, if the lender doesn't meet certain requirements, both in the lending process for the loan and in servicing, then that government guarantee could um, not come into play if an audit is performed or the, the SBA decides that the lender has not done um, that loan properly to the, the guidelines of the SOP or the standard operating SBA. So really, I think that it comes down to to really understand balance sheet experience and then also the scope of the project. So it really, once again, falls into two buckets where we're looking at both the, the personal guarantor, the owner of the facility, as well as the self-storage project itself to determine which, which loan type makes the most sense. With 7A, we're, we're, kind of, we're limited to how much we can lend there. That program goes up to $5 million in runway. Uh, which basically means at any given time, you can have $5 million out for an SBA loan, an SBA 7A loan specifically. But sometimes lenders can actually stretch that amount with what's called a parapasu loan, which is what we do. So if I have a, an $8 million project, I can technically put it in that SBA 7A loan program, even though it's over the $5 million runway cap. And I can use the parapasu loan, which is technically conventional dollars for the banks. So it does hold conventional risk for the bank. Uh, but it it exactly matches all of those SBA 7A loan terms. So you have all of the benefits there as opposed to with a conventional loan in order to stretch that program out. So we can technically lend up to about $9 million in the SBA 7A program. With 504, we can push it up to around 15 and a half, roughly. And then from there, there's also the 504 Green program, which is really... It, it adds a solar energy component. So we can continue to make those loans with 504 Green if the 504 regular program is eaten up by a project for a customer. So that's as far as the lending parameters and, and how much we can lend. Those are pretty clear boundaries for us. The 7A loan, I think, is it, it's really it's a very all-inclusive loan. So really, the customer is coming to the table with their equity percentage, which, again, we can go up to around 85, 90 percent, just depending on the project and the cash flow. But we are adding pretty much everything that the customer is going to need for that project into that use of proceeds for the loan. So the 7A can fund, you know, 
for an acquisition. It can fund the acquisition price. It can fund any working capital that the customer might need. We can put some interest only in there up to around 12 months. That it also covers all of the closing costs. With a construction loan, we can get pretty creative. Uh, we can add some interest reserve in there to cover the first 12 months while the customer is in construction. And then we can add another 24 months of interest only on top of that. So we can add a full 36 months of interest only, interest reserve for during construction, and then operating capital during lease up. So essentially, any time that the business is in lease up and in an operating deficit, that loan, that 7A loan, should be covering the operating deficit with that operating capital that's built into the use of proceeds. So those loans can be really beneficial, I think, especially for a ground-up construction project, but it is limited to that $9 million. So if it's a, a larger traditional build or larger boat and RV build, it would really only be able to fall into that 504 bucket or conventional otherwise. Interesting. Is there a minimum size? Because we talked about maximum. Is there a minimum deal size for you guys? Yeah. So for us, we tend to focus on 500000 or above. Really small facilities, it, it just really doesn't fit within our credit box and isn't super valuable with what we can offer. But as far as the program itself, they do plenty of small desk loans, like smaller $300,000, $200,000 loans. Okay. Interesting. And then what, like what metrics matter in this case? So I know construction is different. There's no DSCR at first going in, et cetera. But if you're looking, do you guys do loans for acquisitions of existing facilities as well? Does that fit into the SBA bucket? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. And really on both acquisitions and on ground up construction, we can look at it on a pro forma basis. So we really often see acquisitions for facilities that are mom and pop managed, maybe a little mismanaged, and there is a lot of turnaround that needs to be done or value add that is available to our customer. So we can take that into consideration whenever we're looking at projections. Typically from a cash flow perspective on an acquisition, if it is a pure acquisition with no true construction component, we're looking to get to 1.15 times debt service coverage ratio by year two and around 125 by year three, just at as a stabilized asset by that third year. The first year, we often don't even see break-even in some cases. In some cases, we do. It just depends on the asset. But it, we don't really have a, a necessary debt service coverage for the first year. We just really, especially if the seller historicals are going to be considerably different than those projections, we need to have a really clear understanding of how we're getting from point A to point B so that we can really understand the projections and how the customer came up with them. Okay, got it. That makes sense. And then as far as are there certain markets that fit the box and then certain markets that don't, like what markets are important for you guys when doing these types of loans? I think about this a lot because I've been telling a lot of people we've seen so much so much movement in more tertiary and secondary markets, especially more rural spots or suburbs. But I'm always surprised, too, whenever I see a deal come in from a larger city that still pencils out and looks great. So I think it's for a ground up construction project, I'd say we really heavily depend on a feasibility study. We do require them for our ground up construction projects. And we have a, a, a list of folks that we work with really often that are experts in the space and, and really understand how to evaluate those micro markets and provide that in my opinion, a very valuable third party, totally unbiased opinion and feedback on whether or not that project is going to be successful. So a lot of times with construction, just because of the risk held with those types of projects, we're really leaning on the feasibility study expert. And of course, you know, especially projects where we're working with a customer who lives in that area, we're depending on them too to have those conversations with the feasibility study expert so that we have a really clear and realistic understanding of what the project's going to look like. I would say otherwise, I do still stand by, I think we're seeing a lot more movement now than we have prior in more rural markets. I see a ton in Texas, I feel like. There's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Texas is a very interesting, great market to be in. Obviously we do, when we look at deals, we see a little bit more supply sometimes than when compared to maybe some areas in North Carolina. But again, that's par for the course. And when you call around to some of the facilities, the competitors, you find that they're all pretty full or 
whatever, or they have decent rents or whatever the case may be. I know at this point in time right now, rents are down a little bit, but you get the idea. Like they're doing, generally speaking, pretty well. I sure. guess they just go big in Texas, which is good. It's very Texan. Yeah, very exactly. Texan. What are, this is a great program. It's obviously a lower barrier to entry because a lot of investors in the, on the front end won't have as much equity to put down on a deal. But what are some of the trade-offs? Because there's always got to be some trade-offs there. Is what about recourse and does it look, what does it look like as far as interest rates are concerned? Like how does that play into the whole scenario? Sure. So I'm, I will say, obviously, especially with that kind of leverage, what we can offer kind of on the, the strength side is it is extended interest only period for both acquisitions and startups. We're looking at a fully amortizing loan. So these loan types don't have any balloons. Uh, they also don't have any call provisions or covenant, especially for someone who's worried about getting stuck with a balloon or who, who's worried about a, a debt service coverage ratio covenant or LTV covenant. Those aren't really associated with 7A loans. So between all of that and leverage, I would say those are the strengths of those loan types. I think the drawbacks are, especially with a 7A loan, rates are going to be a little bit higher than they're going to be with conventional Typically, they're going to be based off of Wall Street Journal Prime, which is currently eight and a half, hasn't budged for about a year. Obviously, that is a little bit higher than what we would be looking at for a conventional loan. And you're almost always going to see a spread on top of Prime as well. There are variable and fixed trade options for SBA. Variable is a little bit more common in the market that we're in right now, I think, with some kind of semi-fixed options. So there, there are multiple rate options available on that loan type. but Generally speaking, they are going to be a little bit higher than a conventional bank loan. The 504 program actually has, you know, a, I think the most, one of the most attractive things about that program um, is the SBA debenture portion is very, very attractive. Usually that rate is below what we typically see in market and it adjusts really regularly. So right now it's right around I think it's right around 6.2. That blended with the 50% first mortgage on the bank loan typically is going to shake it out to, I'd say, somewhere in the mid seventh to mid eights, depending on the deal type and the strength. But it, it is going to be almost always lower than a 7A loan. And then conventional is really bank to bank. So every bank is going to price their conventional loans differently. Risk is obviously taken into consideration a lot more differently with those loan types, too, since it is full bank risk as opposed to as opposed to a, a government backed loan. I think it makes sense. Like it, it doesn't matter. No matter what loan you do, there's always a trade off and something to be aware of as the borrower. So like you mentioned earlier on, there's some DSCR covenants. The listener mm -hmm. or, or the watcher may not fully understand what that means, but at a certain point in time, your property maybe it performs at one level when you buy. Maybe it's a little bit lower than what you want because you're going in there with a value add proposition, right? You're going to raise rents, improve management, whatever it is. So of course the income is a bit lower. The idea is that by year two, three or whatever, your income is a bit higher so that you're able to uh, have a DSCR test from the lender and they determine, oh yeah, you're at now a 1.25 coverage or whatever the number is that they need, 1.3 or whatever. And so somebody might be worried about that. So what you're saying is that, hey, you don't have to worry about that situation with us. Our loans are fully amortizing, which means you're paying it just like you buy a house. You're fully paying down the loan over time which is a great thing you're paying down the principal as well. I think that's a great, it's a great trade-off to have. Obviously the deal has the pencil, sure. but if it does and you have the equity to put down, then it may be a good fit. What sort of, like on a personal borrower level, I assume there's gotta be recourse, right? So there's some sure. sort of recourse, yeah. which is fine, right? So you are borrowing from the government, there's gonna be some recourse. And then is there a certain, can you do this with partners? Like, how does that look? If you have three or four of you together and pool your money. What does that look like? Yeah. So with an SBA loan, pretty much all SBA options are going to have some form of recourse. I, I would say it would be considered a full recourse. It's typically going to be based on ownership structure of the operating company. So really anyone that has 20% or more ownership in that operating company will have to sign a personal guarantee for that SBA loan. Whereas with with conventional loans, there there usually is a lot more flexibility there. It kind of depends on, again, this, those two buckets, the strength of the project and the strength of the guarantor. And with conventional loans, sometimes there are burn-off options or sometimes if there was a 
really strong business guarantee available to the lender. They may not even require personal recourse. So it really, as far as conventional goes, it's going to, again, come down to the lender and their credit box and their credit requirements. Whereas with the SBA, it's pretty much standard full recourse across the board. So I will say if someone has 19% or less, they do not have to guarantee. So we work with folks really often that do still have investors that come in at 2 or 3%. Those investors don't have to guarantee the loan. So it's still perfectly, I would say, acceptable to have investors with an SPA loan. It's just that 20% is the trigger point for a personal guarantee. Got it. And then last question here as we wrap up, on the management side, do you guys require the owner to self-manage the property or can they hire a third-party management company to, to oversee the management? How does that look? Yeah, so you absolutely can use third-party management. I would say it's really common, especially as more and more people are looking at facilities that aren't in their hometown or within a 30-minute driving distance. It just, in a lot of cases, makes a lot more sense in those types of deals. You can absolutely use third-party management um, in both SBA and conventional. I would say SBA has a few more stipulations. Um, either way, we're going to look at the third-party management agreement just to make sure there's nothing out of the ordinary or any major fees that could be detrimental to our customer and our borrowing entity. But but for the most part, third-party management companies are totally fine. There were some pretty big changes to the SBA SOP last year, the standard operating procedure kind of guidebook for the SBA last year that that I think really gave owners a lot more opportunity with third-party management. So we can absolutely work with third-party management or owner-managed remote management too, pretty much all uh, of the above. Yeah. I think that's great because that helps folks like who maybe haven't been in storage before, helps them understand the process and can have someone get in, in essence holding their hand through the management because that's really critical to the performance of the property. So that's a great option for everybody there. Amber, thank you so much. We covered a ton of ground talking about the SBA loans and all that. Let me jump into the final four questions here as we wrap everything up. So talk real quick about a high point in your career and what did you learn from that? Oh, I, I'm going to take a second to brag about my team a little bit, if that's okay. So Please I, do. I, I work in, in brokerage and securities. I, I traded and I managed portfolios for years prior to getting into lending. I got out of that life because I had my son. So I took about a year off right after he was born. And then I was anxious to get back into the groove of things within the workplace. So I, I applied for Live Oak and I just had the most wonderful experience. And honestly, I can say, I think working with this company has been a huge highlight of my career. They just operate differently. They're lovely people to work with. I think that we do things very differently. We have a different mindset internally as well. So a lot of the people I work with are, I hold them in very high regard personally as well. And I think my team's pretty awesome. So whenever I joined the self-storage team, I asked around the bank a lot before applying for that role to, to get more feedback on them since I didn't know them that well. And I just got nothing but great, super positive feedback on the whole team. And being on the team for as long as I have been now, and I can say it was absolutely honest. and. I just, I think they're great people to work with. So that's, yeah, that's always a great feeling. When the, no, it's not. It's always a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. When you have people you like to work with and get along with, it helps tremendously. You feel you feel going to work every day, that sort of thing. So it's a it really good. It's a good environment. I, I adore it. So hundred percent. Talk real quick about a low point in your career and what did you learn from that? I think so. I did not, my background really prior to getting into finance was not in finance. I didn't go to school for finance. I actually went to school for education. So I taught for a little while. I ended up working for a company and getting into a sales role. And I just, I really, I, I couldn't latch on to it. And I really struggled with it. It was a really, so to speak, cutthroat environment. And I felt pretty awful <laughs> Almost the opposite of everything that I've said so far about Live Oak. It was a very opposite environment. And I was really struggling with it on a day-to-day -day basis. 
It was the only time in my entire career that I left a job with no other plan because I just couldn't, I, I really couldn't, again, couldn't latch on to that environment and the idea of what I was doing on a day-to-day basis. I, it ended up leading me to work for a company that was back in my securities and brokerage days, um, a wonderful company to work with. I met a lot of great people, learned a lot through getting like a FINRA Series 7 whenever you didn't take any finance classes, really. In college, I feel like I learned a lot from that experience, but but it did come from having a pretty difficult time before. So I think, I guess I, I learned that one, I guess one size does not fit all whenever it comes to expectations in the workplace. Absolutely. Sometimes the role that we're in isn't meant for us. It's not that we're not, that we're not successful or whatever the case may be, but it's just that we're, that's not us. It doesn't fit. I could not go do education, right? I couldn't go do teaching. That's probably, like, at least for in certain roles and all that, that's just not my thing. I've done it, but I actually taught Sunday school. It's not like for kids, like little kids, I was like, I am not built this way. So I was like drained out of energy and after like 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So not everybody can do that. No, uh, I, I tell our IT folks that all the time. I'm like, I could never, you guys are awesome. Cause exactly. You know, yeah, that, exactly. I feel like it's, I'm, I touch a computer and all of a sudden I have a tech issue. Group. That's awesome. All right. What can you, rec- what's a recommended resource for storage investors if they wanted to find out more, whether it be a person, a book or whatever, a conference, what would you recommend for folks? Oh, wow. Honestly, this industry has so many great resources. I always point people in the direction of ISS. If it is, if they're getting into the industry for the first time, I feel like there is just such a wealth of knowledge on their website. It's also a really great really great resource as far as the annual trade show ton of vendors ton of operators to meet there i think joining your your state association for ssa is also really smart gives you an opportunity to network with other brand new owners and other people that have tons of experience and connect with some more localized vendors which is great i do love self storage income live trade show live conference Every year, it's a little bit of a different different setup than a typical nationwide trade show, but really love that one. And Toy Storage Nation, especially for Boat and RV, I think they, they offer a lot of very similar, great educational opportunities for people to take part in. Awesome. Yeah, those are all great resources. I went to the Toy Storage Nation, not trade show, I forget it's called, uh, workshop. Two years ago or so, then we ended up buying one of our first RV locations shortly thereafter. Wow. So yeah, it was a ton of good information there, good people in a small, at the time, it was a smaller crowd. So you can mingle with the speakers and mingle with the vendors a little bit easier. I'm sure that changes it based upon location, et cetera. But when I went, it was, it was an amazing experience. So very good resources. Thank you so much, Amber. How can people get in contact with you if they want to learn more about the SBA program and uh, hopefully get a loan from you guys, or at least have that conversation started? Yeah. We have my, I think we talked about it right before we started recording, but my coworker Tyler Lambert and I host an office hours bi-weekly. So it's available on our website, on Live Oak Bank's website under the self-storage loan team link. So we host that bi-weekly. I feel like it's, we dig in a little bit more to our credit expectations, our process, our background, things like that. And we always connect with those people too right after we we end the office hours sessions and outside of that people are more than welcome to email me if my email is amber.crucian at liveoak.banks a little bit of a weird email but but people are welcome to to reach out to me that way linkedin really any option works great perfect amber thank you so much for being on the show thank you so much appreciate it chris